And I think that AI, the way it's coming off today, it's like it's this generation's all up internet now. It's like this generation's automobile. Mm. You know, this is like imagine like we were introduced electricity, right? It's something that is a new technology that one is very new to us, likely not going anywhere. But the other part of it too is it's understandably something we can fear because we don't quite yet fully understand it yet. However, that does not preclude us from taking on the task to try to understand it. And especially when it's coming at such a force that we have to reckon with it, where it's like our everyday lives are being impacted by it, whether we realize it or not. And it's now coming into our jobs in our businesses, in our careers, where you got one of two choices is either you adapt and learn how to apply AI and what you do, or you risk getting left behind or risk getting laid off. Because, you know, the CEO of NVIDIA once said, it's not AI that's going to replace your job. It's the person who knows AI who's going to replace your job. Welcome to another episode of Transform Your Future with me, Eddie Eisen, where I sit down with entrepreneurs, thought leaders, and high achievers as they identify areas I can improve on and guide me to further my self-improvement practice. For more information and insights, join my newsletter at transformyourfuture.com, where I write about reinvention, personal growth, and entrepreneurship. If you like the show, you'll love the content on my site. We want to hear from you. Let us know how we can improve your listening and viewing experience. Suggest upcoming topics or a great guest you know for the show. Please reach out to us through our website, your podcast app, comment, or just text me directly at 813-722-1417. We want to hear from you. Today, we dive deep into the journey from corporate life to successful entrepreneurship. Getting out of your nine to five to thrive as a solopreneur or small business owner. Today's episode is titled Dreaming of Entrepreneurship, Overcome Common Challenges and Succeed. I sit down with Philip Blackett, a seasoned entrepreneur and author, to explore the practical steps and strategies that can help you transition smoothly into the world of entrepreneurship. Philip shares his personal journey from working for Fortune 500 companies to becoming an independent entrepreneur. He highlights the pivotal moment when he realized his passion for entrepreneurship and decided to pursue it despite the challenges. We discuss the importance of having a clear vision and realistic expectations when transitioning to running your own business. You need to understand what your marketable skills and passions are, as these are the foundations for business success. One of the key topics discussed is the balance between career and personal life. We spoke about the importance of prioritizing family and maintaining a work-life balance, both of us sharing insights from our personal experience. We underscore the truth that true success is not just about financial gain, but also about personal fulfillment and well-being. Philip also delves into the role of AI in modern entrepreneurship, drawing from his book, Future Proof. He explains how AI can be leveraged to enhance business efficiency and competitiveness. He encourages us to view AI as an opportunity rather than a threat, suggesting practical ways to integrate AI tools into our business operations to save time and resources. The episode also touches on the challenges of entrepreneurship, such as dealing with setbacks and building mental toughness. We emphasize the importance of resilience, faith, and continuous learning in navigating these challenges. Get ready to uncover the secrets to balancing your career ambitions with personal life, developing essential skills, leveraging AI for business growth, and transform your dreams into reality. Philip Papaya! Welcome to Transform Your Future podcast. How are you today, sir? I'm great, Eddie. Happy to be here with you. 
How about yes. you? I'm doing fantastic. I'm having an excellent day. I'm, I'm in a very, uh, high energy, high activity stage right now. Again, I, I've overcame some obstacles in my life recently. I had another car accident, I, hmm. you know, and, uh, going through the rehab and having some surgeries again and all that kind of stuff. I'm, I'm back up to speed and I'm back the way I used to be. I feel good. I feel strong. I feel strong. Right. Let bring it on. Bring it on. <laughs> I'm Just ready. Not another car accident. We don't want no, to bring that one no, on again. No, 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 no. I'm. <laughs> I, 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 I. There's this one road where I live that uh, I had three car accidents on so far. So I'm. I'm oh, trying wow. to avoid that road. <laughs> that would be a good idea. <laughs> so let's jump right in and let's talk about disagree without disrespect. Let's talk a little bit about what got you to write that book. What what interested you about it and what your process was. Yeah, so I think for me, Eddie, it's we're definitely in a time that definitely needs what I was talking about. It's not just because it's an election year at the time of us recording this. I think, you know, disagree without disrespect, how to respectfully debate with those who think, believe, and vote differently from you. Um, a lot of people focus on the vote part in the subtitle, but when you're having people that believe differently, think differently, you're essentially coming across anybody um, that has a different viewpoint on what you think, because, yeah. you know, you might remember this, Eddie, but, you know, growing up, they often told us you don't talk about politics. You don't talk about religion. You don't talk about money on the dinner table. Mm -hmm. Right. Mm -hmm. Now we've gotten to the point where because of social media, um, it's hard for you to have a different viewpoint on any issue without the mm -hmm. fear of being alienated from loved ones, mm -hmm. criticized, on social media, or even unfriended. And I think mm. part of it is that a, we've sort of lost the rules of engagement when it comes to coming across different viewpoints. Mm -hmm. Like we talk a lot about diversity now, diversity, equity, inclusion. There's a missing element of being able to embrace diversity of thought. Mm. And so what that comes about is how do we go about our own interpersonal relationships, whether it's with our significant mm. other, our kids, our parents, our colleagues, acquaintances, our friends, mm. where if you come across something different, you don't shame them or call them outside of their name or unfriend them or cancel them. It's mm -hmm. There's a way to go about it. And I think one of the things that I learned was a good example of that, Eddie, was when I was growing up in Memphis, my mom worked in the courtroom. And she often had two attorneys that would come in the courtroom and they would argue a case. Mm. One was for, one was against. They would argue very aggressively, very passionately. Um, and at the end of the whole thing, when the case was decided, somebody won, somebody lost, there was something that I saw afterwards that for a lot of people, they just couldn't comprehend today. When the two attorneys would exit the courtroom, oftentimes what I would see is they would shake hands. Mm -hmm. One would congratulate the other on the case. Sometimes I would even see them having lunch together, maybe even that same day, mm -hmm. or being at their daughter's soccer game that weekend, or spending the holidays with the family. Mm -hmm. But if you looked at it now, you'd be like, that can't be possible because that's sort of akin to sleeping with the enemy. Mm. But what I learned there was they had a job to do. Yes, they saw things differently, but because they saw things differently, that didn't preclude them from having a relationship beyond what they had disagreement about. Like they could still be friends or good colleagues or acquaintances, even if they disagreed on something. Mm hmm. And I think it went full circle when my mom told me, you know, Philip, just because I disagree with you, that does not mean that I don't love you. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's what really inspired me to write this book, because I feel like that is what's missing in our society today. Definitely. Definitely. I could see that. Uh, you know, uh, I remember uh, we had this saying to be to disagree without being disagreeable, right? Mm -hmm. To to be able to disagree with somebody and say, I'm I don't agree with that, but you know, it's okay that you'd agree with that, but you know that that's your belief. I, d I just, you know, you could do that without calling them 
you dirty anti blah 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 you know whatever um you know and get on your high horse but mm -hmm. it's interesting because my conversations lately have been a lot about how it, it's it's like a it's like a duality of the world where we've got a bunch of people living like they're individuals separated from everybody else and, and in some ways social media and even the ideas of diversity create this kind of idea of like there's a bunch of people we're separate from other people um, but there's also at the same time this movement to understand that we're all connected and that we're all part of something much bigger all of us mm -hmm. <laughs> who are breathing you mm -hmm. know uh, so, so it's interesting this this duality uh, that goes on yeah. I agree. It, it's it's a load of tribalism and individualism and some sort of inter the dependence that we're hoping to get out of this as well. So trying to figure mm. that all out amongst seven to eight billion people in the world um, mm. can be a pretty tricky proposition. Yeah. I, I remember uh, when I was studying sociology that... Uh, I was fascinated by how these studies were done that showed that not only do individuals from different sides of the argument have trouble agreeing, but even those individuals who are on the same side of the argument have difficulty agreeing what direction or which way they're supposed to do it, right? Uh, which is which is fascinating, you know, <laughs> whether it was the woman's, uh, you know, the woman's voting movement. Uh, right. Or whether it was, uh, you know, freedom from slavery and all that. Like there was it was always like, well, do we assimilate or do we, uh, you know, uh, not assimilate? Right. Yeah. It's, yeah. Segregate. Exactly. So it's 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 interesting. It's agreement is something that definitely we need to definitely talk more about in our society, and our culture, because it is definitely an issue. Yes, sir. Yeah, because like the interesting part about it too, Eddie, and you raise a good example on this, is that I think we oversimplify things. Like I think we're smarter than we realize as human beings, where you think things are black and white, like literally and figuratively, right? It's like you're either for this or against this. But oftentimes people don't understand that there's a lot of nuances even to be for an issue. Where like you're saying before, you might be for let's say you know women's right to vote as you mentioned right there mm -hmm. might have been a group of people that were advocating for it but did that mean that all those people that advocated for it agreed on all these sub issues that were underlying the right mm -hmm. to vote like hey does that mean we have a right to vote for our local elections can we vote for president or is it for a school board only mm -hmm. like you know how what's the age on where we can you know be able to vote is it 18 is it 21 mm -hmm. like there's probably many debates, many arguments had in between just your four position or on the opposite side. But I think oftentimes, whether it's social media or just the media in general, they make it so simplified and almost lazy type of approach of just comparing it just between one or the other. But it's never really like that. There's a lot of gray matter in between, a lot of nuances that we have to navigate as well. Sure. Sure. And, and and obviously the media likes to be very polemic. They like to be polemic. They like to always present the arguments like it's you're either this or you're that, you know, and, and, and hate it that way. But obviously life is a little bit more complex than left or right or black and white. Mm -hmm. yeah. I agree. Yeah, absolutely. So uh, you, you wrote the book uh, and you get it out there into the world. What were some of the... Well, what are a few of the important things that people got out of the book? What were some of the three or four main points that you were that you were making that resonated with the audience? Yeah, so I think the main thing or one of the main things that the audience that's read it really take away from it is the five step framework that I advocate. Mm. Um, basically, how to go about disagreeing without disrespect. You know, step one, you know, you want to separate the ideas or belief from the identity of the believer. Mm -hmm. So this kind of gets to the sense where for certain topics, for certain people, you might be so intertwined with what that issue or topic is or belief it is for you that your whole identity is mixed in it as well. 
Mm-hmm. So if you might have said, hey, like, I disagree with this one issue. Now that person may look at it as you're disagreeing with who they are as a person. Mm-hmm. Right. If I criticize their way of living or their belief, now it seems like I'm hating who they are. Yeah. And that's not true, but that's how the perception comes off. So being able to separate is, hey, I, I'm more so talking about this idea in hand. Mm-hmm. You just happen to believe it or agree with it or adhere to it, but my respect and love for you is not contingent on whether or not you agree with this or not. Like that goes beyond that, mm-hmm. right? The second step from there is being able to disagree with that belief and still love the person who believes it. So it's kind of a play off what I learned in church, which was to hate the sin and love the sinner. Yeah. Right? And so it gets back to the whole sense, like, my love and respect for you, Eddie, is not contingent on us agreeing on everything. And if that was the case, I've been married for eight years now. If my love for my wife was contingent on me agreeing with her on everything, we wouldn't have made it past the honeymoon stage. Right? And so the thought is, if that's the case with a marriage, the most intimate of relationships, then that's probably something you can extrapolate and apply to your friendships, your relationship with family, the people you work with, the people you went to school with, that sort of thing, too. And so once you're able to set the groundwork there, you go into step three, which is, I know this is kind of controversial, but I'll say it, you debate the issue strictly based on its merit. I'm just going to pause there in case any tomatoes get thrown at me here. Debate on the ideas based on its merit, meaning the logic, the facts, the analysis, the performance, the results, the merits of the issue at hand. So I'm not engaging in, as you were saying before, like, Name calling is like, you stupid, blah, 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 you phobic this, phobic that, da, 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 da. right? I'm not, you're having a, a mental breakdown. You're having a temper tantrum. You're like, you're falling on the floor. How do I engage here? Yeah. Which would be all the more reason why some people say, hey, mm-mm, I'm just not going to engage there. If you talk about politics, religion, money, any difference, I'm just, mm-mm. I don't know what I'm dealing with here on the other side. I don't want to take a risk. But what happens there is that there's a loss of opportunity to get to know people. Because what often happens when you're debating or you're discussing things of different values, different viewpoints, is there's that diversity of sharing different viewpoints, different reasons, different backstories, Mm -hmm. different perspectives. Like, help me understand why Eddie is so passionate about this issue that's more dispassionate for me. Well, by engaging a conversation with you, Eddie, I get the gift of learning more about you and why it's so important to you. And what are the reasons that might be beyond the surface of what I think is the reason? But you never get around to doing that if you never get around debating the issue based on the merit. And so then step four is basically something that we all should exercise even beyond when we were younger playing sports. When the game is done, somebody wins, somebody loses, regardless whether you came to my side on thinking or I came to yours or we stayed in our separate corners or some third alternative we weren't even expecting in the first place. When it's all said and done, after the debate, I shake your hand. I thank you for the opportunity to talk. I show good sportsmanship. Mm -hmm. So even back to the lawyers I was talking about before, it's like bringing that back. Like you can Mm -hmm. still fight amongst a case and you can still shake hands and still go into the last step, which is appreciating, respecting the person you just debated with and keeping the door open for further conversation, further collaboration even as well. So even it might be the sense that, Eddie, you know what? It sounds like you're very passionate about this one issue. I appreciate you talking to me about it. I still feel a certain type of way about it. 
But nevertheless, I'm at least appreciative of you sharing the backstory on why this is so important to you. I didn't know that beforehand. It gives me a more nuanced, balanced perspective on this. I'd love to be able to discuss this more maybe over lunch next weekend. Or maybe there's an event that talks about this topic itself. Why don't we go to it together? And then afterwards, let's continue the conversation. Hmm. Because what you want to do, if nothing else, is open a door to keep the dialogue going, keep the conversation going. And you want to preserve and protect the relationship. The relationship between the two people should be more important than whether somebody's right or wrong. Mm. That's good stuff. That's good stuff. So nice uh, guidelines there for you to have a conversation and a discussion about something and maybe a little bit of a debate, uh, Mm -hmm. but one that's coming from a place of trying to understand rather than be understood, um, which is, which is important and vital if you want to maintain that relationship, as you said, that's really good stuff. Mm -hmm. So, uh, anything else, um, Anything else you want to talk about in in the uh, in the book besides the five things? Or well, so I think what comes off to me is you know what helps with this book is really focusing on what we call soft skills, communication mm-hmm. skills, mm-hmm. right? And so one of the things that the book highlights is just the importance of active listening, mm. where oftentimes another thing that's kind of missing is that we don't fully listen to what the other person's saying. We are often already trying to formulate in our heads. Mm -hmm. What are we going to say next? Yeah. And by us not taking the time to fully be present with that person, ask clarifying questions, affirm where they're coming from. Even if you don't agree with the issue, you can still affirm where they're coming from Mm -hmm. in their perspective, at least acknowledge that it's important to them. Therefore, it's important for you to know as well. Um, I think another part of this is that, you know, in the age of text messaging, social media, Twitter fingers, that sort of thing, um, I think we're at a fear of a lost art of communication. And Mm -hmm. a lot of times, you know, it's not so much an issue as far as how do you communicate when you agree with somebody, because that could be really short and sweet. But how do you go about things that you see differently? Yeah. How do you go about things that you disagree with? How do you conduct yourself? How do you communicate um, with others? How do you articulate why you feel the way you feel or why you think something is right or wrong or different? Um, that, I think, for the next generation um, and our current generation, that's something that we don't want to necessarily just leave it up to AI, for example, Mm -hmm. to come up with those responses. Mm -hmm. Like, let's figure out how to continue talking to one another as caring, considerate, respectful human beings. Yeah, communication skills are vital, Um, especially if you actually really want to do anything in your life. You need to be able to have good communication skills and understand that communication skills is not just the words that we use, but our body language, our, our tonality when we're talking, all these different things. I mean, I, I, you know, a lot of studies have been done that show that it's like maybe, maybe 5% of communication is the words we say. Absolutely. Um, you know, so, but, but I think you're right. I think you're right. I think uh, the, the idea of, you know, caring about other people, and coming from a place of I'm interested in knowing what you think and why you think it, although I don't agree with that stuff, I would like to know more about why you think that way. Why do you believe that? You know, I think is is something out there. But in general, I think it's also that just, you know, I would say that I found I needed to change my personality at some point. Mm-hmm. <laughs> my, my The problem was my personality. Mm-hmm. And my combativeness and my desire to be in confrontational situations uh, and overpower situations, I found that that was something, I'm not even sure why I was driven that way, if it was biological or something else, if it was environmental, but uh, I, that was something I needed to change in myself. 
and mm -hmm. you know so so i hear you and we do need to talk about these issues definitely and and, and be more aware about them you mentioned ai which i'm mm -hmm. going to let that roll us right into your book future proof and let's talk a little bit about why you wrote that book what was what was going on with you that you decided you wanted to get a book out there about ai well i, I think one of the things that i recognize in my short career is that you know one's ability to adapt to changing environments is really going to prove beneficial for a long lasting and beneficial career and satisfying career for that matter. Mm -hmm. And I think that AI, the way it's coming off today, it's like, it's this generation's dial up internet. Now it's like this generation's automobile, mm -hmm. you know, this is like, imagine like we were introduced to electricity <laughs> Right. It's something that is a new technology that one is very new to us, likely not going anywhere. But the other part of it, too, is it's understandably something we can fear because we don't quite yet fully understand it yet. However, that does not preclude us from taking on the task to try to understand it, and especially when it's coming at such a force that we have to reckon with it, where it's like our everyday lives are being impacted by it, whether we realize it or not. And it's now coming into our jobs, in our businesses, in our careers, where you got one of two choices. is either you adapt and learn how to apply AI and what you do, or you risk getting left behind or risk getting laid off because you know, the CEO of NVIDIA once said, it's not AI that's going to replace your job. It's the person who knows AI who's going to replace your job. So it's not so much fear in the technology. It should be the concern of if I don't learn this and adapt it and, and apply it, I might get replaced. Yeah, I mean, I think we've seen this many times before in society. Um and I, you know, there's a name for it actually, where something new comes along and people are comfortable in the way that they do things and they're reticent to any kind of change. And so the change is really so slow. I, I remember it's this, this thing called comfort zones, right? Mm -hmm. And, and I remember, uh, hearing the story many years ago that when you know, we had manual typewriters and then we had electric typewriters and people didn't want to change. They were like, no, no, that's okay. I, but it's better. It's faster. It's easier. No, that's okay. I'll just stick to my manual typewriter. And then the computer, the word processor came along first. And then it was like, no, 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 I'll just stick to my electric typewriter. And it's like this, this, this thing that, that people are just comfortable where they're at and they, they don't want to change. They don't want to get out of that comfort zone and learn something new. But then you have some people who do. And then they become the proponents and start talking about it and from the rooftops. I think it's interesting. And, and something else that you were talking about here about this generation. Um, back in 2001, I think it was, I, I read The World is Flat, mm -hmm. in which he talked about the beginning of this, how it was the shift that really and experience and technology was going to bridge that gap world so that somebody in India can have a job as a customer service representative for people here in the United States, for example, um, and how it affected so many different industries. Like, uh, you know, I, I spent 36 years, I'm sorry, I spent 30 years in the film industry, writing, producing, and directing. And, you know, that industry went through all kinds of changes um, as time went on because of technology shifts. So I'm sure we're going to see some of that happening today. Uh, because of AI, just being able to take certain functions uh, over. But I, but I think you're right. The people who are most empowered, or anyway, I feel most empowered by, by using it in some way or form to help advance, save me time, save me energy, uh, maybe help me do some research and investigation. Yeah, because uh, I think even to your point, Eddie, and I'm glad you brought up the film industry. There was news I got from LinkedIn that really put this in perspective for me where I was like, I have to talk about this because mm -hmm. I don't people, I don't think that people truly understand the weight and severity of what's happening. Mm -hmm. And there was a story that was done on Tyler Perry 
And he was known recently of basically developing this huge studio in Georgia on a military base, I believe it was. Multiple studios, multi, multi, hundred million dollar development, right? Mm -hmm. A lot invested in building this, the stages, this, you know, all the facilities, everything that you could think of as far as like to film your own projects on, on one Mm -hmm. campus. And what happened was he got introduced to an AI tool that basically could produce movies, like like short films or short like snippets of mm-hmm. food, of, of films, mm-hmm. just by giving prompts. Mm-hmm. And the result he saw of it was so close as being like cinematic, like what you see on screen, mm-hmm. that he basically said, "I'm just going to pause." on the rest of my development of my studios. Mm -hmm. And the reason why he said that was like, I'm introduced to a whole new way of of filming Mm -hmm. that is so different from what I'd done before because I had to have makeup artists to make me look a certain way. Now it's like I can just film and then I could do certain buttons or push certain things and it can get me feeling, looking very much like how it would look like if I had makeup artists doing mm-hmm. my makeup for two hours in the morning. And now, like, you're thinking about stage, you know, decorators and people that pull up the, you know, the sets and that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. Now you can come up with backgrounds just by plugging it in. Mm-hmm. So he's basically saying, look, you know, I'm in a conflict because, yes, I'm a, you know, I'm an actor, I'm a director and that sort of thing. I'm in the actual work doing this type of work, but I'm also a business owner. I'm also an entrepreneur. I'm also someone that has to make sure that this makes dollars and cents, that the bottom line is that there is one. And now I've been exposed to a way that, like you said before, it can make us much more productive. It's also one that doesn't require as many humans to do it that work Mm -hmm. because bear in mind, AI doesn't sleep. AI doesn't take time off. It doesn't get sick. It doesn't feel like in the morning, whether I want to go to work or not. Right. It doesn't look for other opportunities for me to jump ship Mm -hmm. and resign when you least expect it, when you need that person. And now it's like, I could save significant amount of resources and do the same sort of product ultimately, if not better. It would be wise for me to really consider what this looks like before I put any more further investment in what my original plan was. Mm -hmm. So it's kind of like what you were saying before, alluding to when your environment has changed, when you have new information, you can and should make new decisions. And so I think using film as an example, what's happening there, using the example of Tyler Perry, that type of example is being played out across multiple companies in the film space and, Mm -hmm. for that matter, multiple industries worldwide. Yeah. I'm still very involved in in the film community and producers and technicians and whatnot. And uh, I've played with the, the new AI uh, with that. And I've seen a, a lot of people's work and very soon we're going to have somebody who's going to make a full length feature with only that tool. Uh, so we'll see, you know, how it comes out, but it's at the beginning stages and it's only going mm-hmm. to get better and better as time goes on. But the same thing with writing. I mean, you, you know, you spent your time to put something together and research and, and write a book about it. And today, if we want, we can put the information to AI and prompt it to write a book about the same topic, the same subject mm-hmm. that you then could just, you know, edit it out or something. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely, I think it's great for my writing. I use it all the time to help me with research and information, uh, you know, finding quotes and interesting studies and whatnot. It helps me to do that quickly instead of taking the time to search through 15 websites or whatever. So, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I do see it important and I, and I use it in my business and, you know, our, our software company, you know, Traffic Match AI sells, you know, AI services, uh, conversational AI for appointment setting and, you know, uh, and customers and taking them through the customer journey. And it's only going to get better. It's only going to get better and better. Um, 
I played around with the AI. I worked with the company playing around with the uh, voice AI, making phone calls and talking to people. Mm -hmm. And what I was most fascinated about after making 10,000 calls was that most of the people uh, that got on the phone, like 95%, had no idea they were talking to AI. They really believed they were talking to a person. And I found mm-hmm. that fascinating. I found that fascinating. So we're at an interesting time right now where there's a, it's like, it's the wild, wild west. Mm-hmm. And, and people are out there developing things. And, and, uh, I developed a little AI for sales because, you know, I, I love sales and, uh, you know, Me too. you know, I, I believe in, I'm a sales trainer and, and, you know, help develop sales strategies for sales teams and commission only salespeople and solopreneurs. You know, it's, it's very interesting how I created a, a sales objection AI. And mm-hmm. so it's based on a bunch of different things that I put in there to season it. And then you could just ask it a question that, Hey, I, I, this person objected this thing to me. What could I do? And then it like breaks you down and gives you, you know, a page of information just on that one thing of how you could reframe and retarget. So, I mean, it, it's awesome. It's a game. It's really is a game changer in many ways. Um, and I just think we're at the tip of the iceberg of right. what we really can do with it. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So tell me a little bit about the the uh, so the 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 concept of the book. I understand. Tell me a little bit about what was some of the focus of the book. Yeah, uh, some of the focus of the, the book Future Proof was really focused on helping um, the readers get the right mindset on how to approach AI. So mm-hmm. one way to look at that is you know first looking at AI as an opportunity for you that can serve you, that can help you further and propel your career and, and secure your job and not to look at it as a threat. Mm-hmm. You know, if, if there's any threat, it's more about inaction from your part to learn AI and how to apply it mm-hmm. in your job and career. Um, once you got that sense of understanding as, as an opportunity, the next step is really about seeing okay, let's take your job in particular and let's take inventory. What are the things, the jobs to be done that only you can do? No one else should be doing them and no one else probably can do it as good as you. Like this is like your special sauce. This is like Mm -hmm. your sphere of genius, we'll say. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, not all of your job is in that sphere of genius. There's a portion of it that... Hey, as long as it's about 80% as good, we're fine. It can be done by another human being, whether on my team locally or maybe overseas in India. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Mm-hmm. Whatever those jobs are, you can look at that as something, for example, that could be done potentially by AI. Where if nothing else, what it helps you do is it could help save your time to do it. Where if you're doing a task that usually takes you four hours and you have AI take it on and they can do it in like four minutes. Well, now you just save three hours and 56 minutes that could be put more towards what is in your sphere of genius that only you can do. Mm -hmm. Or maybe that could be put towards further learning about the AI tools that you can do because once you got a sense of what can be outsourced, now is the time to do some research of your own. Mm -hmm. to experiment with certain AI tools that are specific to those jobs to be done that you want to do to see which ones work. Not every tool is built the same. Not every tool is going to be here this time next year. So a lot of it is trying to see what works for you to get those jobs done quicker and better that allows you to do more of what you feel like is truly yours to do. And then on top of that, see how you can be helpful for other people on your team. Hmm. You know, you're in this boat with them as well. They're trying to figure out AI as well. You could be that person that could be that Sherpa or that guide Mm -hmm. for someone to navigate AI on your team, on your Mm -hmm. floor, in your company. Yeah. That as you're learning, as you're practicing with other people, you get better, just like AI. Maybe not at the same rate, but if you take a, a incremental, consistent perspective each day, each week, you will get better over the course of a year or so. Mm -hmm. But now you're being seen among your peers. 
maybe your superiors, your managers, and that sort of thing as, okay, this guy, he's like a linchpin to our success going forward. He's somebody we need to keep. He's somebody we probably need to promote and have working on other areas of our business. And so what happens here is like now you're positioning yourself well, where when I talk about future proof in your job and career, it's not only helping protect your potential within that company, but it's also a good leveraging point, honestly, that if they were to move away from you or you saw yourself as not being in the right place, Mm -hmm. you've now increased your skill set and what you bring to the table significantly to the point where other people, other companies would love to have you on board. So now it's a position where it's like, not only am I doing great for my company that I'm working with here, but it's also the sense like, okay, we don't want to lose Eddie either. (laughs) And so that's a great way to look at it, where if you're constantly growing, you're constantly developing, you're constantly helping people as well as, you know, improving and optimizing the work you already do. That's a win-win scenario that I would wish on any employee. The question is, will they take up on it? Yeah. And and certainly, um, you know, it's it's another skill set, you know, like you were saying. Uh, about a year ago, um, I had uh, been involved with something, and, and there was a study that the tech support team, uh, tech support team of a rather large uh, company, started using AI to answer the questions that were coming in through tech support. And um, what it what it ended up doing was freeing up the tech support team about 75, 80% of their time, the the AI and the FAQs and the way that it read that and answered the questions a- answered about 80% of the people's uh, questions and issues. And that other 20% that were more complicated issues, that's what the tech support team was able to handle. So it, it decreased the length of time it took to handle a ticket, right? Mm-hmm. So you had better customer service, better customer engagement in handling their and processing their request quicker. And it helped the support team to save some time from some repetitive information that's constantly going through there. And it helped them to focus on making their product better and really developing those bugs and those higher level issues. So, I mean, it, it was really positive. It was really positive results and, and positive information. So um, we all need to start looking about how we could utilize that to to better our customer service experience, to better our performance in, in what we're doing. Absolutely. Like it, yeah. it definitely frees you up to do more of the higher level task mm-hmm. and work, mm-hmm. you know, whether it's involving critical thinking or, you know, second tier type of customer service, like beyond the surface level mm-hmm. um, that, you know, frankly, a lot of people may not have as much time to do, but, now you do with AI. Mm-hmm. Look, I want to change gears with you a second because one of the other things that I found very interesting about you was the fact that you come from a um, a career of you know working for some very big companies, and at some point you transitioned, right? Mm-hmm. Can you talk a little bit about that? So transition to. Uh, maybe I'm reading this backwards. Did, did you work for some big corporate companies? Mm-hmm. Okay. Do you so still work I'll, there? No. So it's, I think it, That's you, know, you mean like transition about. into like entrepreneurship? Yeah, like at one time or... you were working for Chick-fil-A or something like that. Oh, right? yeah. And, mm-hmm. and then you decided to do something different. That's what I wanted to talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So so I think for me, like I definitely am thankful for the type of experience I've gotten, whether working for a number of, you know, top tier, prestigious, you know, Fortune 500 plus companies, um, along with the education I've gotten as well. I think that what it also shared with me throughout this whole journey up to this point is really kind of helped me understand, like, what is it I truly want to do in this next stage? You know, as I'm approaching 40 in particular, um, a lot of people look at that as like 40 is like equivalent to like midlife crisis. Like, do I need to buy a motorcycle or, or go, you know, backpacking around the world or something like that? Um, I look at it as something more along the lines of, you know, really taking inventory of what's really important to me at this point. And so for me, like my family, you know, I have a wife and two twin seven-year-old daughters. 
Um, they're God entering a you. stage that is should be a fun stage. We we got mm-hmm. through the diapers, we got through the all nighters, you know, of crying mm-hmm. uh, endlessly and that sort of thing. And you know, now it's like they have me- they're going to have memories. They're going to have you know fun stories that they're going to want to live out and tell and remember. And I want to be there for that, you know. And so I think you know my definition of success, my definition as far as like a prosperous career, that sort of thing, it it changes over time. It's a lot different from when I was 20. And so I think the transition for me is thinking along the lines of, you know, I've I've worked for other people. I've worked for myself. Um, I tend to prefer working for myself a little bit more. And so I think it's more so the sense of, you know, really taking on all these different experiences, skill sets that I've had up to this point uh, and really focus on what do I want to do? And I think the books that I've written are a big part of that as far as getting the word out about those books to be of help and of service to other people. And I think the other part is taking some of these skill sets and experiences to help out, in particular, you know, small business owners and entrepreneurs, you know, develop and grow the businesses they always wanted to have, their dream businesses, you know, before life happened with the help of AI. And so really just kind of framing that as far as where my direction is going at this point. Um, and seeing that transition, the way the balance, you know, what I want to do from a career standpoint now, and, you know, having the right type of availability with my family, uh, at this particular stage is, you know, the perfect win-win for me. Yeah, I, I get you. I get you a lot. And certainly we can, how you help transform businesses. We certainly could see how AI is transforming everybody's lives right now in the world. Um, and you transform from a nine to five, so to speak, uh, into working for yourself and being an entrepreneur. Uh, and I'm just curious, you know, a lot of, let me just say this. There's a lot of people out there who are in nine to five that would like to work for themselves, would like to have a, a business so they can be more in control of their own time, their own life and find more fulfillment. Um, but they don't do it. Right. So mm-hmm. some, something happened in there when you went from one place to the other. There was some mm-hmm. transition that happened in there. And that's what I'm kind of digging a little bit to see what kind of things uh, got you to do that. Yeah. So I think one thing is understanding is that, listen, you know, do you want to build a full out business that employs a number of people? Like I've, I've run a business that had 25 plus employees that was, seven figures in revenue. Like I've, I've done that sort of thing. Mm-hmm. There's good things I like about that sort of experience. And there's some things that I probably be fine doing without. Mm. Right. I think it's kind of one of those things where when you check that box, you're able to say, okay, I've, I've done that. I've won the t-shirt. I've seen what that looks like. I know what I like about it. What I love, I see what I don't like about it. Um, what do I want to do differently? So I think for some people, it's, you know, in that stage of trying to think about, branching out of nine to five is the thought of what do you want this to look like? Like, mm-hmm. like plot out for yourself. Like, how do you go about it? If you want to work from home, like, what does it look like? What do you want to do? What are your skill sets that aren't just things that you're particularly passionate about, but also are things that are marketable and are of value to people to the point that they're willing to trade their heart and money for your products or services. And so I think that that's a key thing, too, where you're thinking in terms of, you know, I want this outlook as far as being able to control my schedule, be able to work wherever I want to work, um, spend more time with family, not be beholden to a boss that tells me where I need to go and, you know, when to jump and how high and that sort. Um, Mm -hmm. The trade off is more so since like understanding, okay, okay, you're going to have to bring in income from somewhere, though. So if it's not income from doing certain jobs to be done for somebody else, you're going to have to provide something of value products or services to somebody that they're willing to trade their money for what you provide too. Mm -hmm. Um, And so you got to figure out what that is. And then the other part of it is, is that oftentimes when people don't understand is that when you're working for yourself, oftentimes you're working a lot more than nine to five. Mm Mm-hmm. And I think what goes with that is, do you have the discipline to self-govern yourself without having somebody 
lurking over you or somebody giving you a performance review every six months um, that you know what are the things you're trying to achieve in a year and then you're bite sizing that to here are the things that I need to get done each day. And it would be a success for me if I can complete at least 80, if not 90 percent of those tasks. Um, some people can do that. Some people need a little guidance. Some people will need a little handholding. So that's something just to be honest for themselves. So I think those are a few examples where I think that if I'm talking to somebody who's looking to branch out nine to five, I want you to have as balanced, as realistic and as um as practical of a way of looking at how do you make this work? Because ultimately I don't think you want to do this just for a few months or a year and then find yourself back in a nine to five. If hmm. This is something you really want to do. Then you have to put things in place where this is sustainable that you can provide for yourself, for your loved ones and do that, not just as a short term project, but for a long term viable play. Yeah. You know, and many of those skills actually you can you can learn, right? If you don't have them now. And it's true that we might be dependent on knowing that if you're not showed up if you don't show up at work at eight thirty in the morning tomorrow morning, that somebody's gonna say something about it and they're gonna write you up. So you make sure to be there before eight thirty. Uh and then if you work for yourself, there's nobody doing that and maybe you don't show up until later in the day. Um but you know, you can you can self discipline. You can learn how to do that, and you can figure out how to build those new habits into your life. Um, you know, by recognizing the value and you know why you do it, and you know what it's about and what you care about. Uh, because as long as it's rooted in something like that, your values, um, you know, then it'll all work out. But I think, though, like you're not giving yourself enough credit, I feel like, you know, going like even being a writer and and, and publishing books like mm -hmm. this is something like many people think uh, I should write a book, but they never do. Right. right. So something's in, there's something inside of you, some process you've gone through, something that has made you believe in yourself that you have the confidence that you can do this. And you've went out there and you and you've done some things and then you you got more confidence and you went out and did some more. and You got more confidence. You know what I'm saying? And so like something happened in the beginning, somewhere along the line, there some idea that got implanted in there, some inner thing. Like I know sometimes people say, you know, I knew that I was supposed to do more in my life. I knew that I was meant to do something uh, important, you know, and this is like their driving, you know, force. Yeah, I, I think if anything, I think it's probably more of a credit to my grandmother who's no longer with me. It's that, you know, when I was growing up, I didn't know what being on the autism spectrum was, mm. but that was what I was on. I mm. didn't quite get things as quickly or process things as easily as others. Mm. Um, you know, I was nonverbal until I was about four years old. So mm. for me to even have this conversation with you, the way I'm having this conversation with you is a miracle. Um, I would say so. And I think that my grandmother was a huge part in seeing something to me that I didn't see in myself, um, having that type of time and investment with me to show that, you know, you can achieve anything you put your mind to, if you're willing to work hard for it. Um, and beyond that, just demonstrating that for me, just by her example and her like working with me, whether it was something as some as rudiment, uh, as as fundamental or elementary as like, you know, practicing my handwriting or doing math flashcards to all of a sudden say, hey, listen, you're starting to pick up on this whole academic thing. Just imagine if you just kept this up. And, you know, if you're a valedictorian of eighth grade class, like imagine what this was like if you can keep this up and go through high school with it. And so it's like, OK, you just keep on taking it to the next level. It's like, OK, you've been, you know, you've gone to these places to study. You worked at these type of companies. You start to realize for yourself, OK, like what's separating these CEOs from you? What's separating these companies from what you can do? Mm -hmm. And I think that, you know, even just authors, right? I've, I've self-published self seven books right now. I think I'm at my end right now. I, I won't close the door just firmly just yet, but it's one of the things that thinking in myself recently is like, okay, what's separating you from authors that are, you know, published by major publishers? Okay. They have a major publisher, but that doesn't mean that you can't figure out what it is to put out a good work as far as writing books and 
doing what you need to do to edit and provide the right content and work nights and weekends to make it work and mm-hmm. that sort of thing. And, you know, what's separating from you? So it's kind of more of a sense, Eddie, where it's just like, you know, you come this far, Philip, like, why not keep going? Like, why not you? Why would you stop now? Mm-hmm. And um, mm-hmm. yeah, I just want to take that mindset um, until my last day here. Yeah, I want to talk to you about one or two more things, but let me ask you this question. Uh, what about challenges, uh, obstacles? Uh, you know, I've been in car accidents. I had to go through a terrible divorce. Um, you know, I was addicted to drugs. Uh, I gained a lot of weight and was terribly obese and had to lose a lot of weight. And, um, I, you know, my health issues. I mean, th- I've had all kinds of sh- – uh, the economy crashed and I had a – uh, cut my losses and start over. Um, mm-hmm. I mean, w- what kind of obstacles have you faced? Uh... Well, it's not easy being someone on the autism spectrum as mm-hmm. one growing mm-hmm. up. Um, I didn't have a present father in my life growing up. And so as a man trying to figure out his identity and who he is and what his purpose is, uh, not having a pivotal figure like that in your life can be uh, challenging. Um, I've also been laid off before, um, after college working in wall street and that sort, you know, we went through this thing called the great recession Mm. and, um, you know, first one, first in first out kind of comes into play beyond just economics. Mm -hmm. Um, whereas all of a sudden you might deal with some hardship, which could lead to, you know, some things I've experienced, whether it's foreclosure, heartbreak, Mm -hmm. uh, business failure, um, suicidal thoughts of some of these failures in my life and that sort Mm. where I think the big thing for me, Eddie, is, you know, I think you can resonate a lot with this is that, you know, if you live long enough, um, you're going to go through tough times. Mm -hmm. You're going to go through hardships. Mm -hmm. Everything's not going to be sunshine and rainbows. All right. Um, That's what the movies are for, Um, you know. Um, But I think the big thing that comes out is just how do you stay resilient and just continue to believe if for no one other no one else but yourself that, you know, if I just keep going at this and just keep the faith, you know, tomorrow yes. may be better. Yes, and faith. if you do that enough times, like, you know, amazing things can happen. Yes. <clears throat> faith. You mentioned faith. And of course, that's that's also very important, right? Uh, for me, it is anyway. It, you know, the belief that there's something more than me and we're all connected, uh, you know, and there's an overarching principle over all of it uh, that has to do with the gifts and talents that God gave me. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's awesome. So um, let's talk about the core four for dream business growth. Let's, let's yep. uh, break that down for me before we uh, end our talk for today. Yeah. So when I think about helping business owners and entrepreneurs, like through my dream business makeovers, like what I talk about first and foremost is the core four dream business growth. First two, every entrepreneur and business owner are pretty much very familiar with. It's grow sales and grow profits. That's what you do over the short term as far as each year. And mm-hmm. you know, talk about grow sales, like top line, grow profits, bottom line. We definitely help on those factors. But the other two, many business owners and entrepreneurs don't regularly think about but are still very important, especially when they're thinking about what they want to grow into over time uh, beyond just a year. And so the first one is grow via mergers and acquisitions, Mm M&A. That's top line. Oftentimes it can impact bottom line as well. It's more something you could achieve in a year, but sometimes it takes a little bit longer. So it might have more of a long-term focus. Mm -hmm. Um, Then the last one is grow exit value. And so oftentimes when you're looking to exit out of a business, um, most people want to sell it. And if you want to sell something to somebody, you must have something of value if they're going to exchange it for money. In particular, if you have a certain number in mind Mm -hmm. so you can fund that retirement you always wanted, or at least the funding for your next chapter, your next deal. Mm. Um, And so the part of that goes in the sense is like, how am I, preparing myself for that sale, not three months before I actually try selling it, but how do I start doing that now? Right. It's kind of like the whole phrase where it's like, you know, the, the best time for you to start was yesterday. The next best time is today. Mm-hmm. You know, it's kind of the similar thing here. It was like, you want to build the type of business that someone can see as valuable that you want to purchase. 
you want to start putting those seeds in the ground now. And mm-hmm. that's what I really try to help people um, yes, yes. really get a grasp of, which when you're talking about exit value, it actually encompasses the other three. Growing sales, growing profits, and growing via mergers and acquisitions. That's a part of a 18-step checklist that I work with with business owners on to mm-hmm. get at that grow exit value part so they can absolutely mm-hmm. grow the business of their dreams mm-hmm. um, so they can achieve the goals that they had when they first got started. Is there certain types of businesses you work with, Philip? Yeah, usually I, I tend to do well with businesses that are, have revenue between, you know, as low as like $250,000 up to like 10 million. Um, I'm tend to be industry agnostic, even though like services are a place I really tend to do well with. Cause it's really understanding like the human element mm. beyond just like manufacturing and producing. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, that's what I would really say. It's just like, you know, Definitely, like I could work with startups, but I tend to prefer more established businesses. Mm-hmm. I would say. Mm-hmm. Very good. Um, I'm going to drop in the show notes information about how to get in touch with you, and if any of uh, the small businesses want to reach out and uh, get that checklist from you and see about working with you, to, so they can build the business of their dreams. Is there anything, any parting thoughts you want to leave me with? Listen, I think every day that we we wake up, it's a blessing. And what we have with those 24 hours or so is, you know, what are we going to do with that blessing? What are we going to do with that gift they call the present? And so I think that, you know, my parting words here is essentially, you know, we talked about a lot of topics here, (laughs) quite frankly. And my my advice is that, you know, if there's something that we talked about that resonates, um, don't let it just be just a good thing you heard. Figure out how to take the next yes. step towards applying it in your life, whether it's, you know, grabbing a book, scheduling a, a call, um, going to a website or just applying a lesson learned in your own work or home life for that matter. Just make sure you just don't just sit on this as just another fun podcast to listen to. Um, take action. That's yes. what I would say. Thank you, Philip. I'm going to be in touch, bro. I really appreciate your time taking your time out on a Sunday. Absolutely. Had a great conversation with you, Eddie. I'd love to do it again. Thanks so much for the opportunity. For more information and monthly topics of interest, please go to transformyourfuture.com and join the newsletter.